to this meeting and to our support staff. I'd like to welcome you also. In the absence of a quorum this afternoon, we'd like to ask Christy Anderson to bring before us some items that are a concern to her. So Christy, let's turn it over to you and um, we'll respond and react as you would ask us to regarding what you have for us this afternoon. Okay. Um, we mentioned last month as part of our educational programming that um, I was going to put together a presentation on the Architectural Restoration Field School at Poplar Forest, which is outside of Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, it's something I've wanted to do since graduate school, and, and finally, 16 years later, I got to go. Um, Poplar Forest was Thomas Jefferson's private retreat, and it afforded him some privacy that um, he couldn't find at Monticello once he re retired from from public service. It's the only other house he designed for himself um, other than Monticello and it was his dream home. He considered it his most perfect architectural work um, and it took 20 years for him to complete. Construction began in 1806. Um, in the 1840s the house burned and then experienced a series of unsympathetic modifications over the years. The goal of the Corporation for Poplar Forest was to do a, a museum quality restoration utilizing materials and techniques um, when possible that had been specified in the very detailed um, letters and records that Jefferson left. Um, Poplar Forest is an NHL. So after spending five years as minister to France and traveling Europe, Mr. Jefferson returned to re introduce elements of classical architecture and landscape design in America. The Villa Rotunda is the embodiment of the Roman Villa Retreat. Um, and I quote, he said, since antiquity, the villa has remained um, remarkably consistent in form and purpose, a home in the country designed for pleasure and repose, a place where owner and guest can forget the cares of the everyday world. Um, so designed by Andrea Palladio, um, he, Mr. Jefferson introduced kind of Palladian design into American architecture and incorporated it into plans at Poplar Forest, Monticello, Barbersville, the Virginia State Capitol, and UVA. Next slide, please. Jefferson's interpretation of Palladianism incorporated the use of the octagon. The man loved an octagon. Um, <laughs> Jefferson took advantage of the landscape and proportions to create the illusion from the front that the house was one story. The pediment conceals the two-story dining room space in the center of the house, which is a perfect cube. It's 20 by 20 by 20 and is illuminated by a 16-foot skylight in the, in the space. The basement is accessible from the rear and tucked away staircases as Jefferson felt staircases were a waste of space. Next slide, please. This is a rendering of what they think the, the access road and curtilage looked like in Jefferson's time um, based on historic archaeology. Um, the Palladian architecture is strongly based on the symmetry, perspective, and values of formal classical temple architecture of the ancient Greeks and Romans. In the late 18th century, extending wings became an important part of that style. Jefferson interpreted the wing with another, and I quote, kind of air quote, architectural block by building a wing of offices on the inside and installing an alley of paper mulberries on the west. Each of these wings is terminated by a mound that was originally planted in trees with an octagonal privy located behind each mound, creating visually, if not architecturally, a five-part Palladian plan. Next slide. The front portico incorporates four Tuscan columns that are rendered brick to give the appearance of stone. There was no intention of having them appear white as is the modern convention. You can see the house rests on a raised foundation, but the portico and railing conceal the true height of the building. The heavy entablature and balustrade also conceal a built-in gutter system. Next slide. 
There's a view of the rear of the house with the wing of offices, what we would consider service rooms, believed to house a kitchen, a laundry, cook's room, storage, and smokehouse. A combination of historical archaeology and the meticulous records of Mr. Jefferson allowed this wing to be reconstructed. On the far left of the house, you can see a rise. Um, one octagonal privy is located behind it. And these were not pit dug privies. Um, it had a little access hatch on the back that got cleaned out. Um, next slide. Uh, interior details of window restoration in progress and the central skylight with a mock-up of the entablature that used to be in the room. During the house's occupancy, the ceiling in this room had been lowered to create more living space in that two-story um, central space. The imagery mixes those of the baths of Diocletian and ox skulls. Um, it was a liberty Mr. Jefferson took because it was his private space to enjoy. Next slide. A replica of the octagonal dining room, dining table in the room, as well as replica chairs. Um, and replicas are being used so that the visitors may sit on and touch the objects in the room. Um, the herring, there's a white oak herringbone pattern on the floor, which is a little hard to see here, mm -hmm. um, which was another European influence on the execution of the design. On the right, a room in Mr. Jefferson's personal chamber with a view to the south and the sunken lawn. Next slide. The southernmost room of the house faces the lawn and is an, is an elongated octagon with chimneys at either end of the room. On the right is a campeche chair, um, which is one of his favorites. Next slide. A portion of the building will remain unrestored to show construction methods used in early 19th century building. The use of brick nogging on the right may be more familiar from older English buildings where the nogging or brick infill is visible on the exterior of a building between timbers, creating the half-timbered look that was replicated in the American Tudor revival of the 20th century. Nogging served a number of functions, rat proofing, noise proofing, fire proofing, and insulation. <clears throat> Next slide. So up to the roof we go. A scuttle access above the bedchamber leads to a floored, storage, a floored storage platform. A second ladder gets us into the attic where we could see timbers notched and pegged together. Next slide. Up one more ladder. <laughs> and through the hatch. Um, behind the baluster seen in the earlier photos is a platform located over the dining room enclosed with the Chinese railing. The skylight was also shuttered. The roof shingles were, were, that were originally chestnut um, and were replaced with tin in 1825. The current roof is stainless steel installed over a modern roof membrane. Next slide. One of the elements of historic integrity is setting, which is why landscape is so important in, in a lot of what we look at. While poplar forest would still be architecturally significant, if it was surrounded by asphalt, it would not have the same visual impact. Poplar trees and a long approach help separate poplar forest from the modern, modern world. Um, and while there is a modern sub subdivision to the south of the property, it is well screened from view by a mature tree line. And there's almost no cell phone reception here. So it really is separated from the modern world. Um, next slide. So this is the terrace roof over the wing of offices, accessible through a door at the top of the stairwell. Um, next slide. The flat roof covered a guttered substructure. Um, it's one of Jefferson's inventions that he also employed at UVA and Monticello. Each roof was different. Um, at the bottom of each, you know, between each rise, there was a gutter. They went out to a gutter on the exterior wall. Um, each was different and each roof leaked. <laughs> Sawtooth pattern runs widthwise with the gutters at each low point draining into a gutter system at each long side of the terrace. Next slide. This is the restoration crew. These three guys um, have, have 
hand hewn and hand worked a whole lot of woodwork in this building. Um, Vince, Brian, and Dave let us invade their workshop and demonstrated some of the techniques they've used to reproduce building elements in much the same way as had, had um, they had been originally created. Next slide. This is the rest of the restoration crew. Um, Brian's dogs that uh, helped those of us who were a little homesick for our pets. Next slide. And this is just, they have, I think, 750 hand tools, and each of those planes will create a different molding profile. Um, next slide. The field school. Next slide. Um, our fearless leader was Travis McDonald. He's been at Poplar Forest for nearly 30 years, and he's the go-to guy for research, documentation, and restoration. And he does a fabulous job of organizing lectures and field trips, grills a mean barbecue chicken, and if the man tells you that there is a gourmet Exxon in Charlottesville, he's not lying. He also wasn't lying when he told us there was a final exam the day before class ended and we're like, yeah, right. And it's like, no, really, there's a test. Um, he meant it. Next slide. The good people of my class um, having a communal dinner. Uh, we stayed, we lived in, the, we stayed at a, a camp and shared dining facilities and cooked dinner and enjoyed ourselves until we had to write the final report. Next slide. So what is the program? The program is intended to focus on understanding how to plan and implement a museum quality restoration. So it included um, lectures on Jefferson, on architecture, on, you know, how of the context of how difficult it would have been to get some of these materials to this particular location at that particular time. Um, conservation techniques, um, we got to go places that some folks just don't get to go at some of the other historic sites we visited. Um, and then there was also a, an architectural investigation project um, they do have staff archaeologists. Um, they were going to be starting their summer dig a couple of weeks after the field school. And they found, for example, in the sunken lawn where plants were planted and what the spacing was. And they've been able to do pollen analysis. And with the notes that Jefferson left, they know what was planted there. Um, you know, they're in the process of redoing the front approach. Um, they removed some boxwoods and very sizable boxwoods that were not to Jefferson's period and are, are hoping to reintroduce that front landscape in the next year. Um, next slide. Lectures included Jefferson's work on influences um, as well as information on construction and decorative elements from the 18th and 19th century, molding classical orders, how to date nails, paint analysis, mortar analysis. Uh, time was also spent in the workshop with the restoration crew where they discussed materials and demonstrated tools and techniques. Next slide. So I took a picture of the, the item on the left because it's pine tar, which is used as a wood preservative, but the label says as used by the Vikings, and that's why I took the picture of it. Um, Sarco on the right is a glazing putty. What you'll find if you go out to Lowe's or Home Depot, you're going to find DAP 33, but um, Montgomery's resident window woman brought me a big Ziploc bag of, of Sarco to try on the windows I'm working on right now. So um, I've had the opportunity to play with that too. <laughs> Next slide. Architectural investigation in this case meant ticks. And I actually brought one home with me. Um, we spent two days in Hurt, Virginia trying to to determine the evolution of a house that was purportedly built in the late 18th century and added onto sometime in the early 19th century. 
So we open walls and ceilings to find traces of changes. Next slide. We pulled nails and took paint samples, documented the use of materials such as the stone slabs and foundations. Uh, next slide. We found a hidden room behind that door that had been covered up on the, the left. Um, documented measure, measured rooms in detail such as doors, fireplace mantles, baseboards. Next slide. We took mortar samples and conducted mortar analysis tests back in the workshop to find clues that might help determine the evolution of the house. Uh, next slide. We sustained ourselves with some good food in Lynchburg, including the wandering donut, which was all, almost magical. Um, the donuts remained soft throughout the morning that we took them in, and by lunchtime they disappeared, so it was like a, a magic trick, disappearing act. Next slide. We had several days of field trips um, that included other properties Jefferson designed as well as some other notable locations. One of the perks of going with Travis is that you get to go where most folks don't get to go. Um, the interior photos of Monticello are on the third floor, which is where you get to go if you give them a lot of money to go see the third floor. Um, the door on the left has a cat hole, which is where they pop a cat in the attic to chase rats. Um, an upper domed room that is visible from the rear of the house, which is the view that you usually see on your nickel. Um, a little hideaway at the end of that, that um, space where Jefferson's granddaughters used to hide out um, because the house was often full of visitors and they also needed a place to get away. And Mr. Jefferson often took his granddaughters with him to, Mon or to Poplar Forest. Next slide. The lawn at the University of Virginia is a series of colonnades and pavilions that provided classrooms and housing for professors and students. And at the head of the lawn was the library rotunda. Next slide. Barbersville Ruins, a house once again incorporating octagons that had been designed by Jefferson for James Barber, who was the, the governor of Virginia. Next slide. Montpelier from the attic. Figured y'all could find a picture of the front of Montpelier. Um, the home of James and Dolly Madison. Um, this is another property that had a major undoing. It had been purchased by the DuPont family in the early 20th century and, and doubled in size. Um, so the Montpelier Foundation removed those later additions to restore the house to the, the era of Madison's retirement of 1816 to 1836. Next slide. Prestwood Plantation. This is an absolutely phenomenal late 18th century house museum. Um, it's restored with original finishes and furnishings that have been painstakingly reassembled by the director, Julian Hudson. Um, there was an extensive inventory of the contents of the house, and over 30 years he has tracked down a lot of the original furnishings and put them back in. Um, it is off the beaten path near Clarksville, Virginia, on the Roanoke River, but if you have a chance to go, go. Um, it was built in 1797, um, Georgian house, and it, 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 is, pretty, it is pretty stunning. Um, it, ha it does have an accompanying, I believe there's a cemetery, a garden, and some portion of the slave cabins on the property as well. Next slide. Takeaways and lessons learned, also known as ideas we can steal from other people. Next slide. This is one of the things that was fascinating to me the, the, in the things are not always what they seem category. The color that we all know and love is Charleston green, which is that real black green. Um, is really a version of, could you go back one? <laughs> It's really a version of this green, but something in that pigmentation over time oxidized and turned black. And both Montpelier and Monticello did paint analysis on their Windsor chairs, which 
you know, thinking about Mr. Blanding's builds his dream house and this big mid-century colonial revival, let's make everything look New Englandy. Um, Windsor chairs were black. Well, they found that their Windsor chairs were bright yellow and bright orange. So again, it was something in the paint that over time um, changed, it changed color. Next slide. Building plaque. I thought this was an interesting idea um, to consider for future awards programs when we have, in particular, a building that is really being recognized for um, work that has been done to it instead of giving someone a plaque to, to hang in their hallway that this might be something to actually affix to the building where we would have something that was cast fairly substantial um, we could probably do a number of them at once if we left the date off and that way we just have them to hand next slide source guide um, someone went through and, and and compiled what resources were available um, with information related to poplar forest in local and statewide repositories. And I would think that something that might be helpful for folks in Montgomery who want to know more about their houses is if we had just a list of what resources are available where where can you find city directories where can you know what kind of information is at the probate office and what kind of resources are montgomery specific at the state archives because for people who don't do this and are not accustomed to doing research it can be very intimidating and i think if if we could at least give them a guide for the type of material that's out there and where to go to find it um, would, would be a, a real good step toward um, maybe making it less intimidating for folks. Next slide. One of the things that is laid out in the field school is kind of how to work through a process of restoration but also how to work through a process of reading a building. How do you look for clues on how a building was altered over time? Um, I have mentioned previously that it might be nice to copy what Mobile does to some extent and offer a preservation leadership class. Um, and I think a, a component of that, which I don't know that they do, but I think would be a good one, might be how to read a building. Um, when we had the designation petition for Madison Avenue, one of the house owners, after he read my description, said, you know, I looked at the front of that building and I knew something wasn't quite right, but I didn't know what it was. And it was that someone had sided over windows. The, the facade wasn't symmetrical anymore. And he said when he went in and looked at the drywall on the inside, he could see a little bulge where he thought the window was still underneath it. So I think just, walking people through how to understand their buildings especially but particularly before they buy something and just decide that they're going to make it look a certain way come hell or high water so next slide finding good solutions for modern issues um, on the left they created a bench copying the Chinese rail pattern from the roof to create a, a buffer um, because it's high enough off the ground that a good code official wanted them to have a railing and it never had a railing so the solution was to have um, anchored benches um, that would, would provide that barrier from, so people wouldn't tump off the edge of the porch. On the right we've got two things. That little flat red box is a wheelchair lift and um, that terrace roof never had a railing either so they opted to use a modern material that was fairly visually invisible um, so that they weren't they, apparently they, they had discussed introducing a Chinese rail pattern but felt that that, that took it too far into the 
creating a false sense of history, which the Secretary of Interior standards caution against. So they went with a modern railing so they could meet code and people could go out on that rooftop. That, uh, Christy, that was a nice handrail too on the steps. Uh, there's, you can barely see it yeah, on the just, but you could just, see it earlier. Just yeah. a pipe rail. It's yeah. A, it, 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 just, just no, barely. actually it's brass. I think it's brass. It's, then it's got the little mm -hmm. donkey ear or whatever on the end, but it was required, but they did a really good job yeah. on that. Next slide. And on a personal note, my personal takeaway was that Thomas Jefferson's freehand drawings were just as awful as mine. So I feel like I'm in good company and not being able to draw a straight line. Um, next slide. This is the last one. Lynchburg's version of Chris's hot dogs. <laughs> the Texas Inn. So, um, all work and no play would not be very exciting. So, um, we are partaking of the, the local cuisine. Um, if you go to Lynchburg, you need to order a cheesy western. You just don't ask, just order it. So. So that's all I have. A few ideas we might be able to, to steal. Um, a little bit on architecture. Um, if anybody wants to go to a field school, it's two weeks um, of seeing and learning and peeling off paint chips and picking ticks off you. At least it was this year. So, any questions? No, but some good ideas. Um. Well, to do a plaque, we would need, I think, to revisit the idea of branding, of, of separating the logo that we use from that of Landmarks Foundation, um, which is a good idea anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I have one other thing. Dr. Bailey, do you have anything you want before I launch into this other item? No, go right ahead. This is homework. Um, The, the Architectural Review Board, we, we have struggled with finding good solutions um, for people to have outdoor storage. And by and large, the, the prefab storage buildings um, that you find in the parking lot at Lowe's and Home Depot do not conform to what we have right now under um, standards for for accessory structures, which is that they need to be compatible with the house. And generally the two sticking points have been that those buildings do not have a horizontal lap siding and they do not have an overhanging eave. Um, a discussion thread on, a, on the NAPC listserv discussed some other municipalities offered up how they handle it. And this is coming to you because you all are charged with developing guidelines for the ARB to use. Um, so I've included some of that discussion about, you know, buildings under a certain size or staff approvable. Um, the, the ARB had a few things that they wanted to make sure were part of this, that an application would still be required, that if certain conditions are met in a petition that staff might approve it, um, a building not to exceed 100 or 120 square feet, that would be 10 by 10 or 10 by 12 that there's no other outbuilding on the property. Um, multiple buildings starts to pose issues from a visual clutter standpoint, but also a, a possible issue with zoning coverage. So um, the lack of any other structure would need to be verified. The structure needs to meet building code requirements and zoning requirements, um, which would be setbacks from the property lines and separation. Um, if they wanna put it for example, for most of our districts, um, 
you need to be five foot off of a side property line if you're an interior lot and if you come closer than three feet you have to fire rate your building and get a variance and that sort of thing um, no metal siding is is what i've seen it's because there, apparently there are some new ones that look more like lap siding but there are also some very ugly metal buildings out there and then there was a question a discussion about visibility you know is it is it visible from the street have they has it screened um, kind of approaching these is more of temporary structures than a long-term solution um, I don't if someone says they want to build a playground equipment or you know swing set in their yard I don't want to see it I assume that once their kids grow up they're gonna get rid of that swing set because they're gonna want their yard back so um, by and large we don't we haven't looked at, at some of these things um, so we are turning to you to put together some ideas that may help us streamline the process for people who just need a place to put a mower and a rake versus you know a place to park a car Did they give us a suspense on this, Christy? Uh, give you what? A suspense when they would like us to get back to them? No. Okay. Sooner than later, though. Okay. I appreciate <laughs> that. But um, to that end, Carol and I talked about this earlier today. I did, uh, I have a presentation on outbuildings that includes photographs of different outbuildings in, in the different districts. Um, and also kind of labels the parts that if you all want to see that in September, that can be our educational component for September to coincide with a discussion about what, what, a poss what possible guidelines for these smaller storage buildings might be. What do building, building codes say about electricity and water? Um, I believe for power, there's not an issue with power. The utilities have to be buried. They do, to, okay. To run water to a building, you have to get a variance. Oh, unless okay. unless you're zoned in a multifamily or duplex, kind hmm. of. Okay. I had to get a variance to build the garden house because our garage hit our coverage allowance. And that was one of the things the Board of Adjustment kept asking me. You're not going to have plumbing out there, are you? Like, no, I'm not. Right. Just water. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, to run water to a, I believe, huh. I think you'd have to get a variance to have anything that might make it habitable as living space. That's what they're trying to avoid. Is there any question, um, any kind of feedback, anybody, or any comment anyone would like to make? Is there anyone who feels that we cannot have something uh, to give Christy at our next meeting? Is that too soon? I think, I think we can, uh, no, I mean, I think her presentation will sort of pull us together. However, I think we can, just looking around us, uh, come up with things we see are vital or per pertinent and then things that are not sure as to certain ty type of roof configurations slopes on approaches porches stuff like that mm -hmm. um, I, I think you'll find some of the comments from other cities interesting mm -hmm. because some of them are as basic as the form conforms which means as one one person described it you have a rectangle with a triangle on top of it. You know, that, that is as basic as they get on the form, which rules out sheds with barn-shaped roofs. Not really a common... The Gambrel look. That, even for yeah. housing types, it's not a very common roof in Montgomery, and certainly not in the districts. Not so, in urban. Um, so I think you'll see that some, some of what they propose is pretty straightforward, that, you know, windows can be of any material, but they need to be in a, you know, a vertical kind of up-down position like you would find on a house. Um, you know, what, about, what about a double car garage structure? Is that the size I would think would be somewhat prohibited to code and to aesthetically? You'd have to go to the board with that. This yeah. is really geared towards 
a place to put your bikes, your lawnmower, your small tools. accessory type yeah, of thing. This okay. is this is a ten by ten, ten by twelve max. Oh, that's right. I shed that, that we're yeah. we're looking at, trying to streamline the process for the hundred feet, the hundred square feet. Mm -hmm. Then, in other words, for a hundred, so it, no more than ten by ten, or not ten by tw uh, twelve. Or, yeah, yeah, something like that's that. That's right. I forgot that part. So if someone needs an 8x10 shed, then if it meets whatever other parameters, um, there might be an expedited process for it. So I'm, uh, I'm understanding what is proposed. This is going to only apply to historical districts? Yes. Okay. And would it be for new or existing structures as well? It would just apply to new. Um, so it would be from whatever point that it was adopted forward. So anyone who came in after, or shoot, anyone who's come in and had a storage building shot down that might that the board has denied, and there have been a few in the last few years um, that may that may fall under this where they could do it. Um, but no, it, it wouldn't require anyone to change anything they've already got. So if you if I understand it, then you wouldn't be able to buy any loads or those kind of simple storage sheds because of the metal siding. So that that's out. So you Possibly, I mean, because most well, if you see what the metal, you'll see. I've got a picture of one in my presentation. You all see next month. Um, but what it, is the option? What I'm trying to get at, what would I see that they could? reasonably buy in the same price range that would qualify most of those prefab sheds are built with uh, t111 siding which is a, a, gr a vertical groove plywood panel and that is something that the board has generally frowned on because it, it doesn't mimic a historic material at all um, I think it's Knoxville in this packet that they allow that material if someone will go one step further and apply battens over the grooves. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a little more of a profile. Um, and there are a couple of buildings, I think I've got photographs of a couple of buildings in Cottage Hill that used a board and batten um, on an outbuilding. Well, I think I would like to see what it is we're talking about asking them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that that would be commercially available, or whether they would have to be constructing something. Yeah. I, I also mm -hmm. like the thought that is in this uh, discussion where if it's not visible, mm -hmm. in my backyard, if I put something behind my detached Everybody garage, would nobody it. would ever oh, yeah, see it. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things that has come up, you know, there there's a a line of I think it's called Suncast, and there it's a, some sort of PVC, you know. And some of them are fairly small, and one of them's a lean-to. Like if you put it up against the back of your garage, just so you could hang some shovels in it. But right now, the board will not approve that. But you know, they're they're like two feet by four feet. You know, some of them, and that would mean that someone could make application. We know it's there. Um, but they could do, they they would have an alternate an alternative to having to hire someone to stick build a two by four tool closet for their rakes. That's what we're we're trying to to get at. But I'll have pictures of of examples of what some outbuildings look like. And well, I think that would also include some other types of exterior structures too. Do you think like a, like a gazebo or something like that? Uh, if it's a size frame, you know what I mean? What do you think? I... You don't want to go down that route? I don't think so. Okay. Because... Leave it to ARB. Because there's a whole lot of decorative that can happen with that that right. may be good or bad, and the height is going to be an issue. I mean, none, none yeah. of your prefab sheds are going to tower over a house. Right. Um, there, there could be some issues with gazebos yeah. and separation and attachment. I'm just thinking of other, you know, fancy. Yeah. Fancy dog houses um, and playhouses and stuff like that. We made the decision that um, the building department considers anything under three feet that it's not a structure. So we have said if people get permission to have chickens, 
and they their and their chicken coop is less than three feet tall, mm -hmm. we're not going to consider it a structure either. Mm -hmm. So if they want to big build a chicken palace, yes, we would <laughs> need to see it. Yeah. But if if they keep it mm -hmm. fairly low and and spread out versus a vertical um, chicken house, we wouldn't review it. Okay. So that te should technically be our homework is to come up with some thoughts on that, requirements on. Um, yeah, because right, right now, you know, we had someone who pulled in a, it was much bigger than, than what we're talking about here, but pulled in a, a storage building with a roll-up door on one end, and they had to go in and put on siding and new roofing material uh -huh. to keep it. And it mm -hmm. probably ended up costing them more lot, than it would have been to just mm -hmm. build one mm -hmm. when all was said and done. Um, so it's just trying to come up with ideas that might be pre-approved. Not only no, not pre-approved staff approval because people start thinking pre-approved, they That's think they can point. just do it, and That's they right. can't. That's a which real is why, point. Yeah. Which is why all windows go to the board now. Staff um, but to come up with some more economical options than what the board has been able to approve mm -hmm. to date. Um, because the ARB is not, cost is not part of their deliberation. Right. They, are, they are only supposed to consider whether or not they think the building is compatible and whether or not the materials are suitable. And um, as the guidelines are written, they don't have a whole lot of flexibility on, on permitting these prefabs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? We have our assignments, Chris. We have our mission before us. And Mr. Long, I will include the information you sent in the next packet as well. So when we have hopefully more warm bodies here, we can talk about your suggestion of a, unless, unless you want to talk about it now. <laughs> Uh, that, that's that's up to the, the group. I, I've been on enough projects and stuff to know it sometimes takes a while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to, to talk, discuss new ideas. So that, okay. Well, I'll include that with next next month's agenda as well. Um, so we'll, we'll roll that over. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Christy, for all of this. And uh, let me say to our commissioner, uh, James Long, how much we appreciate the research you did and the level of interest you've shown in helping us to not only uh, expand what we do, but to actually provide a greater service to the community. And I think this is what this is all about, pro providing a greater service to the community. So we want to thank you so much, and we will discuss this at our next meeting. If you're allowed to Surely, go right so ahead. You should have said something. All right. <laughs> Uh, what, I, what I'm proposing is very simple. The national, on that thing you had something almost like the National Registry of, uh, and Montgomery can do a, a registry of historic places, just like the National Registry, and have a flag just like the National flag of, uh, of that has the, it's the Registry of Historic Places. Montgomery can have something similar to that, where we issue that to places in Montgomery. We already have 13 places that own the Alabama registered a plaque, but we don't have the city recognizing any of those places. And so, you know, that's what I'm talking about, uh, expanding that, that opportunity, the regulations that are already there. By the way, I looked at what you sent me with regard to the city uh, uh, ordinance regarding the commission. The number two thing on there is that we're supposed to make an inventory of historical and significant places. So all I'm propose is that we set up some procedures and stuff to do that, uh, and we can talk about that further. We need more than one me is what we need. <laughs> right. um, I'm going to be resurveying Capitol Heights. We've got 900 properties to check. Um, the survey is more than five years old. Um, so if anybody wants to, to walk with me in Capitol Heights this fall, let me know. Um, and that's actually a roster or that, you know, there's a list in other words. Right. There's a register uh, that exists. 
computerized um, so that when you go before the ARB and, and you're doing some alterations, you, you, your addresses are flagged and that Christie has, you know. We've got um, about 2,200 properties that fall under design review. Which is basically the Montgomery Register, you know. But I to that end, we, we have talked about needing to rebrand and revamping the sign right. program. And because as you can see, we had two petitioners for tonight. Um, some months we haven't had any. That, that we, we need something to kind of reinvigorate or get people interested in what we're doing and um, actually do things that people might be interested in um, and try to reel them back in. So I, there, there's a, we have a lot of opportunity. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, and that's a good that's a point in that you do have an inventory. I mean, there's an official inventory as approved, you know, in the different historic districts, and then there are individual properties as well that are locally designated, and it really wouldn't take much to then call it something. Right. I mean, it's basically. Yeah, a well, file the, on Christie's computer, but I mean, well, it could the, definitely have a title to it. The the difference is, though, I guess the properties that are on my list are regulated. It's not honorary. It is it is a right. regulated district. Um, so I I don't know. Well, and they meet; they have to meet a certain criteria to actually be on there, which is just like the Alabama Register and or the National. They have met some type of criteria that and actually, gives them. Uh, for mm -hmm. our, cri our criteria for local designation follows the National Register criteria. Mm -hmm. So it's 50 years and not 40. Um, Alabama Register is a little looser on what yeah. it will accept for material changes and that sort of thing. but. Um, and then doing also the um, local designation, because I'm surveying something right now. Yeah. Um, Christy requires you, or likes you, to follow the Alabama Historical that's what our That's what our code requires. You know, their paperwork. So our designation process is basically to that quality. Uh, and it's not real simple either, because you've got it here on your website. I mean, it, the printout, you can see it's... <laughs> So. Anything else? Would it be, could I ask for an update on Mr. Ward? Um, was, would, did a letter go out? Yes. Was there a response? No. We sent a letter to him and to Brantley Lyons, the city councilman. Um, and Wilbur Hill told me when I spoke to him today that he's going to talk to Charles Jen right about being replaced because he's been to two meetings this year. Which uh, district is um, Mr. Jen Wright? Nine. Okay. How often is it that this commission meets and has no quorum? The last time we had a meeting where two members showed up was May, mm -hmm. frequently. So was there, it there have been There have been two other meetings this year where there's not been a quorum. We, I don't think we had a quorum in June either, but we were doing an awards presentation, so it didn't matter. But I don't think, I don't know that we had five people here. Yes, we did. We, we did, did have five. The Bushes so were we had here. five in June. You, mm -hmm. you were here. Mm -hmm. And Wilbur was May. Here. I think it may have been May. May we had two because yep. Carol was out of town. Because I was out. And Dr. Bailey and Mr. Bush showed up. Um, and I don't think there was not a meeting in January. I was out in January, um, but there wasn't a quorum in January either. That meeting. But we was did canceled. have one because I did that history, <clears throat> that neighborhood history in January, I think. And I got pushed to February because Paula canceled the meeting in my absence. You would just think out of a board with nine people, you probably could get five to be here. You would hope so. Um, but, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, we've got a married couple on the board. If you lose one, you tend to lose both. Um, 
Mr. Long is filling a seat that has been vacant since Willie Cook was alive. I mean, that District 6 has been vacant for about seven or eight years until he was appointed. Um, so we're just kind of limping along, and I keep sending councilmen updates on what we need and how we can't function, and, and some of them are more responsive than others. So we just keep pushing. Do some of these council districts not have historic districts within their boundaries? There are, for all intents and purposes, two council districts with historic properties. With the exception of Powder Magazine and Chapel House, which are kind of out there on their own, they're in District 4. Everything else is in District 3 and District 7. Anything else?